All right, kiddos, welcome back. We're starting a new unit today. Um, the first part of this unit, we're going to be doing nomenclature, which is naming and formula writing. And we're going to do it for ionic compounds, covalent compounds, and acids. So we will get really good, I hope, at naming and formula writing. This is one of those units that's going to be really, really important for the rest of the year. So please, if you need to watch this video two or three times or the videos that are coming up until you figure this out, please do so because it's going to be hard to move forward unless you do that, unless you understand nomenclature. Okay? All right, now compounds are made of two or more elements. Therefore, it's necessary to know how to combine these elements to make a compound. The chemical formulas give the ratio of atoms of each element in a compound. Now, there are three types of compounds that you will um, learn how to write formulas for and also learn how to name. It's very important that you can tell which type of compound you're asked to name or write a formula for. So you need to know if the compound you're writing a formula for is an ionic compound, a covalent compound, or if it's an acid because the naming systems are different for each. So you need to be able to look at the formula and identify it immediately as ionic, covalent, and acid. Then you can use the right naming system to name that compound. Okay? Now, we are going to start with ionic compounds, folks. All ionic compounds can be formed in one of four ways. We can have a metal element bonded to a nonmetal, and that's where we're going to start, by the way. We can also have a metallic element combined with something called a negative polyatomic ion or radical. We can have a positive polyatomic ion and a nonmetal, or we can have a positive polyatomic and a negative polyatomic. Don't worry right now about what polyatomic ions are. We're going to get to that shortly. We're going to concentrate today on a metallic element bonded with a nonmetallic element. So the first thing we need to know how to do is to tell if an atom is a metal or a nonmetal. Now, we did this earlier in the year, but we're going to review it. Some familiar elements are obvious, like gold, tin, silver, iron, etc., and nonmetals like sulfur, carbon, and oxygen are obvious. But there are some unfamiliar elements like lanthanum or niobium and selenium. We don't know whether they're metals or nonmetals. So if you remember, we need a system to identify them. So on the periodic table, um, not well, you can use the back cover of your text, or you can use the one at the front of your notes. Um, we drew a line that appears on the right-hand side of the table. Let's go ahead and draw that line again. Use my highlighter here. It starts under boron, remember? And it's a little staircase line. It goes all the way down to the bottom. Remember, these guys over here are non-metals. All of the rest of these guys are metals, except for hydrogen, okay? All right, oh, press the wrong button there. So, um, that line separates the metals on the left side and the non-metals, which, of course, are on the right side. Now, write whether the following elements are not metals or non-metals based upon their position on the periodic table. So, go ahead and take a minute and do these six. Just find them on the periodic table. Decide if they're metals or nonmetals. Remember, if they're on the left, they're a metal. And if they're on the right, they're a nonmetal. So let's take a look at a few of these. Selenium first. So let me get a different colored pen out here. We'll highlight this maybe in, in red. So selenium's right here, kiddos. Looks like that is a nonmetal. And how about palladium next? Palladium. Um, I think we still have my red on here. So palladium is right here. And that looks to me like that is a metal. Let's do iodine next. Iodine is right over there. So that is a non-metal. How about dysprosium? Where is dysprosium? Is that a metal or is dysprosium a non-metal? You have to look a little while for it. It's way down here. And those guys on the bottom of the periodic table, remember, are metals. All right, how about niobium? Niobium. See if you can find niobium now. 
And it doesn't look like it's on the non-metal side, does it? Do you see it? Yep, it's right there. That is also a metal. And then finally, the last one you had to do was arsenic. It's right here next to selenium. That's an easy one to find. Well, maybe for me. And of course, that's right on that border, isn't it? You remember, it's right on that line. And since it's to the right of that line, for naming and writing formulas for ionic compounds, we are going to call it, this time, a non-metal. But if you had said a metalloid, I don't think I would have been too upset. But for naming and formula writing purposes, we will call that a non-metal. It's on the right side of that line. Now, elements that form ionic compounds have a charge. Remember, ions have positive charges or negative charges. And it's the attraction between opposite charges that holds the atoms together. Metals always form a positive charge. Non-metals always form a negative charge. So we have a metal bonded to a non-metal. One's positive, one's negative. They'll be attracted to each other to form an ionic bond. Well, let's talk about binary compounds first, and these will have two elements in it. These compounds always end with the suffix "-ied". They will always end with "-ide". So let's do some easy ones first. In fact, the most common of all, sodium and chlorine. So let's find the oxidation number of sodium and the oxidation number of chlorine. So we have to go back to our periodic table for this. Let's go ahead and clear this so it's not quite so claustrophobic. And sodium, kiddos, is right here. So remember, it has 11 electrons, and it wants to get 10 like neon. Remember? So it loses one. When it loses one, its charge is positive 1. Very good. Chlorine. Chlorine's right here with 17 electrons. Doesn't it want to get to 18 just like argon? So it gains one. So it is negative 1. So if I have the sodium ion that's positive 1, and it comes close to the chlorine ion that's negative 1, they're attracted to each other, and they form the compound NaCl. A nice pretty one-to-one -one ratio. The charges add up to zero. NaCl would be the formula. So when positive and negative charges are brought together, the sum of the charges must be zero, since all compounds are neutral. So the formula between sodium and chlorine is Na. CL. Notice I don't have the positive and negative charges drawn in any longer. They're gone. They've canceled each other out. There are no positives or negatives left over. So notice that the positively charged ion or atom is written before the negatively charged ion or atom. And that's just simply traditional. So the positive one will come first, and of course that's followed by the negative one. Now, to name this, remember, they all have to end in "-ide". So what would the name of the compound form between sodium and chlorine be? Well, we would name the positive ion just with its element's name, sodium. And then since all of these binary compounds have to end with "-ide", we're going to end the negative ion with "-ide". So we'd say sodium chloride would be the name for that compound. Okay, let's do a couple more here. Let's do the formula between barium and iodine. Okay, barium and iodine. So let's first look at the charge for barium, and then we'll look at the charge for iodine. So let's go to our periodic tables again, and let's go ahead and clear this. It's a bit easier to see. Okay, barium, folks, is right down here. It has 56 electrons. Doesn't it want to get to 54 to have a noble gas configuration like xenon? So to go from 56 to 54, it has to lose two electrons, so barium would be two positive. Iodine. Iodine's right over here, kiddos. It has 53 electrons. It also wants to get to 54, but it has to gain one electron to do that, so it is one negative. Now remember, when I write a formula, the sum of the charge has to equal zero. So don't I need two of these iodine one negatives? That way I have two positives and a total of two negatives. 
So the formula would be BA, then I would write I with a subscript 2 next to the atom that I need 2 of. So the formula for barium iodide is BAI2. It is not BA2I. Don't do that. You put the subscript beside to the right of the element that you need more than one of. So to name this, it should be pretty simple. We're going to name the element barium. And then we're going to change the ending of iodine to iodide. So this becomes barium iodide. This is the name and this is the formula. Now, things become a little bit more hectic when we run into elements that are found in this center region of the periodic table. Those whose oxidation number we don't always know. These guys and these guys. Remember, most of them can have more than one positive charge. For the metals. Except for, remember, zinc is always positive 2, silver is always positive 1, and aluminum is always positive 3. But all of those other metals in the middle of the periodic table can have more than one charge. So it becomes a little bit more complicated when we name and write formulas for them. So what if we end up with iron and fluorine forming a relationship together? So let's find iron and we'll find fluorine. Let's clear the page so we can see this a bit better. All right, here's iron and here's fluorine. Now fluorine's pretty easy. It has nine electrons. It wants to get to 10. Fluorine is going to be negative one. Okay, so fluorine will be negative one. Put a one there for you. And now what about iron? Hmm, iron has 26 electrons. Remember, these guys end up being stable when they're full or half full. It turns out that iron could be positive two or positive three. It has one of those two oxidation numbers. So we have to write two different formulas. One for iron, that's positive 2. And the other one for iron, that's positive 3. Remember, fluorine in each case will be negative 1. So let's write formula number 1. If iron is 2 positive and fluorine is 1 negative, won't the formula be FeF2? Right? Won't the sum of the charge be 0 if I have one of these ions with a 2 plus charge? and two of these fluorides with each a negative one charge. Well, what do you think the formula would be when iron is three plus? Well, we'd need three of these fluorines with a negative charge, wouldn't we? So we'd end up with FeF3. So there are two possible formulas between iron and fluorine. It depends upon what the oxidation number is, what the charge of that iron atom is. If it's iron plus 2, it's FeF2. If it's iron plus 3, it's FeF3. They cannot have the same names. We'd like to call them both iron, right? And wouldn't we like to end with fluoride? Well, then the second name would also be iron fluoride, but they are both different chemical compounds, so they both have different chemical and physical properties. So there has to be a way to distinguish between the two different types of iron. And the way to distinguish is actually very, very simple. If it's iron plus two that you're talking about, you put in parentheses, after the word iron, the Roman numeral two. That tells you you're talking about iron plus two. Guess what you put in parentheses if you're talking about iron plus three? That's right. You would put the Roman numeral three. That's if you were using iron plus three. So FeF2 is called iron two fluoride. FeF3 is called iron three fluoride. It's not because of the number of fluorides. It's because of the charge of the ion. If the metal's positive two, we call it Roman numeral two. If the metal's positive three, we call it Roman numeral three. Guess what it would be if the metal were positive five? 
That's right, we'd use the Roman numeral 5, and so on. So keep that in mind. Let's do one more example, and then we'll call it good for today. Okay? All right, let's name the compound CUS. So the formula is CUS, one copper and one sulfur. So let's go to our periodic table. Let's clear the page again. And find copper. Here's copper. It's one of those that can have more than one charge. By the way, copper can be plus one or plus two. We don't know which one we have. And it's bonded with sulfur. All right, now the sulfur one's easy. It has 16 electrons. It wants to get to 18. So sulfur's negative two. That one's easy. But what copper are we dealing with here? Well, copper, we don't know its charge. So I'm going to put a question mark there. Something positive. But don't we know that sulfur is negative 2. So let's name this. It's copper, and remember copper can be positive 1 or positive 2. So we have to use Roman numerals here, and then we would end it with sulfide. Well, how do we know what charge that copper is? Doesn't it have to match up with this Roman num or doesn't the Roman numeral have to match up with that positive charge? We don't know what it is, do we? Or wait a minute, I think we do. If sulfur is negative 2, and there's one of them, what does copper's charge have to be if there's only one copper? That's right. It must be positive 2. That way, the charges would add up to be 0. So that would be copper Roman numeral 2 sulfide. Notice there aren't two copper atoms and there aren't two sulfur atoms. This Roman numeral 2 is the charge of the metal. All right, we're going to do a lot of practice with this, so come back. See you soon. Bye-bye.